Yeah, maybe you want to omit that from the whole from the whole thing because we probably don't want the FBI coming knocking on the door to ask us who are other other customers uh, that we have who might. I, be I like that. It's a good story. And <laughs> so, did those guys really name their app after a meme? Huh? Buckle up, fellow kids! It's time for Founder Quest. I mean, okay. Once once you get that Trump tweet out there, <laughs> um, you know it brings down yeah. the hammer on you. No collusion. <laughs> I liked, yeah, I liked Ben Finley's suggestion that we kind of just put out a no collusion preemptively, like, you know, a disclaimer tweet. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That's law. Right, yeah. Right? I think it is. It's like, um, it's like calling shotgun. Uh, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just call no collusion um, ahead of time. I just wrote a message to my um, friend, the orthodontist, to ask her about how people sell stuff to orthodontists. Direct mail. Direct mail. I've always wanted mm -hmm. to do direct mail. Like, Designing postcards, putting them in the mail. Um, it's, it's just, all good. you know, I'll give it to you. Like direct mail does have this sort of appeal to it, but also it's like most, like I've never actually bought anything from direct mail. I don't think. You know what's like huge, like big business in direct mail? It's political mailers. What? Oh, yeah. yeah. So th let's get into those. <laughs> so my friend, I'm just going to describe this in case we decide to put it in the podcast. My friend, the orthodontist, was described a, um, a marketing issue that they have um, that they have to do this process manually and it's a real pain in the ass and it doesn't really map well to any generic marketing solutions because they have to coordinate between, you know, a uh, prospect who's also a patient. So there's medical stuff involved. They have to get in touch with their dentist. And so there's like a two party thing happening. And um, she's like, yeah, you should build me this software. And so I just, uh, I just messaged her and was like, okay, so how do people actually buy software? in orthodontist land do people come and like demo it for them do they when they buy do they come back and then train the staff because all that stuff just sounds like a lot of work boys like i don't know how to do that well it's mm -hmm. pretty easy to do but yeah it's a lot of work no i mean i i know i would know how to do it but i don't know how to like manage people to do it you know what i mean wouldn't it be wild though to have like a a, a fleet of reps out across the country out showing software and <laughs> like a real enterprising mm -hmm. business. Totally. You know, though, on that note, a, a, an area of software sales that I've always found interesting and intriguing is school systems. Like they have the most horrendous software. And I'm pretty sure it's only because they have to deal with companies that have to deal with their purchasing process. And so these companies are yeah. like, you know what, because of your messed up purchasing process, I'm going to force you to use this craptacular software. Ha, you know, take that. Mm -hmm. Oh, know? totally. And totally. So my, uh, my partner, Evie, was, uh, she used to do web stuff at this uh, well-respected local university that I will not name. And it was just amazing hearing about the amount of money they were paying for a new CRM, like a CRM in 2019. Um, the University of Washington, which is not the school that she worked at, was much bigger than the school she worked at. Their CRM is WordPress, but no. Um, this little um, private school has to have this weird, like, enterprisey CRM because it does all these things, meets all these mm -hmm. requirements, and it's something. It's like they're paying something like twenty thousand a month for it. Like That's it's nuts. insane. Nuts. It's insane. Uh, a CRM or a CMS? Oh shit, a CMS. I always get those confused. No wonder nobody calls <laughs> me. But no wonder, I'm, like, I suck at sales, guys. You are not going to be a sales rep star. No, well, you got I'm just I'm just publishing <laughs> my sales leads for the world to see. I don't even realize it. <laughs> but but yeah, I've I've kind of you know we talked about uh, Josh's food truck dream and like one of my dreams of you know once there's sunset money involved and I don't really have to work anymore, what kind of things would I like to do? And I think like volunteering to replace the craptacular software at schools is something I would like to do. I'm just going to show up. I'm going to be the white knight. I'm going to just like replace all your bad software. Just like, and I'll just like set up shop in their basement. Exactly. <laughs> then I'll ride off into the sunset and everyone will be happy. Right. Oh, you poor boy. <laughs> like you're not going to be the white knight. You're, you're going to be. That Don sounds Keely. like, that sounds like a, like a slow, uh, terrible death to me. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does. Uh, you're going to be tilting at those windmills. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the part of the, part of the motivation is like listening to my, my sons deal with the software they have to deal with because all their teachers use this uh, online software for like managing the assignments and you turn assignments in and like half the time they're like, I can't turn on my homework because the site's down. I'm like, oh gosh, you know, as a, yeah. as a, you know, 
a person building software for businesses to help them keep their sites up, like that just makes my skin crawl. Like, you know, my sons can't turn his homework because their sites down. It's crazy how many like yeah. industries are left, like some of the, you know, the more traditional industries are like left in that situation though. It's, it's not just education. I don't think like you hear that sort of story from a lot of different places, like healthcare and um, like service, you know, like contractor type industries and those sorts of things. We've talked about, um, like we've talked about how it would be fun to do a, a company that serves like an entirely, like an entirely different, like out of our wheelhouse type of industry. I mean, it's kind of like totally the opposite of what we've been talking about, um, over the last couple of months, but yeah, I think it would still be fun. Um, if we wanted to throw everything out the window and just start over, <laughs> try to go after something new. <laughs> but, yeah. Not the way to do it though, you have to bring somebody on board who knows that industry. Right. You've got to have an insider. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think we just put in the disclaimer right now. This is a not official business advice, right? Don't, <laughs> don't throw away everything you, all the experience you have and all the advantages you have and just. I don't think it's throwing away bad. I don't think it's throwing away because look, um, I think I said in one of the previous sort of marketing shows, it's like, yeah, if I started a, um, a custom cabinet shop, I could outmarket the hell online out of all the custom cabinet shops because like, um, software as a service companies and sort of online sales in general is just a couple of decades ahead of just normal sort of mom and pop businesses in terms of marketing. Like the product my friend was describing they were, they were needing for their uh, orthodontist practice. It sounds like something that's very, it's so, like something we would just sort of take for granted and just have intercom do for us or whatever. But because it's, there's some special requirements, you know, those things don't quite yeah. work. So I, I, I think it's not throwing away. I think it's like moving to a sort of smaller pond where you can be a bigger fish and use your expertise as a, um, as a fish to um, catch more things that fish catch. <laughs> but you know, you did, yeah. catch it, worms. I think the point that we're trying to make is that there, that, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of weird fish out there. And, and if you haven't spent a lot of time in the pond, then <laughs> you might not know what fish you're dealing with. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to talk about um, systems, right? We're programmers, we build systems for a living, uh, we think in systems, we eat, breathe, and sleep systems. But, you know, there's like a lot of systems that aren't really, um, they're not programs, they're just kind of these manual systems or these sort of systems of thinking about things that we've put in place. So first of all, one thing that I've actually heard from people, like people want to know because we're a company, we have three guys, we have equal ownership. Um, I don't think we're legally allowed to fire each other. So how do we, uh, oh, I saw you make that face, Ben. I saw you make that face. I was, I, I was pondering like, how? He's like, well, I, I, could, I could find a way. Damn, this is going to turn into Game of Thrones. Like, before you know it. So like, how do we make decisions? I think, you know, to start off, one of the things to remember is that even though that we have different opinions about how to accomplish some things, and so we have to come up, we had to come up with a framework for dealing with that. I think if you back up a bit and say, but uh, we all have the same long-term goal, right? We, we have the same mentality mm -hmm. when it comes to the kind of business we want to run, uh, the kind of customers we want to serve, uh, basically how we want things to look in general. Like we all have, we were on the same page from the beginning on that. So that, that helps resolve a lot of differences right there, right? Because we all want to be the person who's sitting on the Iron Throne when the yes. final credits run. So that helps. Uh, but, you know, I think when it, we kind of fell into it by accident from the start, like, you know, three developers, we had things we wanted to build and like Star, you fell into just doing the front end stuff because that was interesting to you. And Josh, you were doing the client stuff because that's what we needed to have done. And I did the back end stuff because that was fun for me, right? And so we got mm -hmm. started, I think, accidentally, but it worked out really well. Just focusing on a particular area, I think that helped avoid a lot of stepping on each other's toes from the outset. Sometimes when people have asked, like, how do you uh, work together? And like, what's your process? And I was like, at least earlier on, um, it's like our process was kind of to not work together. <laughs> the answer all. is just that we don't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you avoid, you avoid all sorts of conflict if you just don't, if you don't work <laughs> together ever. <laughs> And it sounds bad, but I mean, you're building this business and there's so much work to do and there's so many different pieces of it where, yeah, like three guys can easily, you know, each have their own silo and people say silos are bad and they do have their own problems. Um, yeah. Like you, you need to have, like, you want to make it so that people can, you know, dip their toes into each other's silos. 
yeah, initially that worked pretty well, didn't it? Yeah. And I don't know, like as someone who freelanced for their, like pretty much their entire career and like, I, you know, I've always had a home office. I'm, I kind of, I'm comfortable in my silo. So yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice in here, guys. That's exactly how we, uh, we approached it. Essentially. We approached it like three freelancers who were just working on the same yeah. project. I, like we didn't really want to change a whole lot. I don't think. But over time, you know, of course we have come to have disagreements about certain things. Uh, have we talked about the logo experience before on the podcast? Oh, I don't know. I don't think oh, we did. I don't know that the people are ready to hear. Yeah. Them. I think, I think that was the first major one where we all had uh, some opinions, right? And uh, they yeah. weren't the same opinion. And I think <laughs> we, we didn't like, formulate this plan, but I think what came out of that experience was like one of us has the ultimate responsibility for a decision. And whoever that person is, that person gets the final say. Like, I guess they get the extra. Well, who had the ultimate responsibility for that decision? <laughs> that was you, Star, because you're all. The- I don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was totally. I think well, we have very <laughs> different memories of this because I don't really feel like I had. Well, I think the, the, the point was I think the point that Ben is making is that you were supposed to. <laughs> and, we, yeah. and we like, we like ripped that responsibility out of your hand and, and like <laughs> tried to tell you what was up. And, and that's when we decided, like, okay, we need to like, like have a have a process for like who has you know who's who's driving this ship or whatever. So a little backstory and a confession. Um, nobody really called us out on this. I really expected somebody to call us out on this, but for what two or three years, um, our logo was a font awesome icon. <laughs> Like, yeah. you know, that that font that has a bunch of icons that just people use with bootstrap and stuff. It's free. It was just that. And it was a lightning bolt because I thought that would be kind of cool. It doesn't have anything to do with Honey Badgers. Um, but yeah. the, you know what? They didn't have a Honey Badger icon or I would have chosen that. It was just a fun, awesome icon. So eventually we were like, okay, we're like making some money. We should buy a real sort of logo. Yeah. And what were some of the... Like, I think I went to 99 Designs first and everybody hated everything because there was all like... Weren't there some cartoon Honey Badgers involved at some yeah. point? Yeah. 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 It was... Yeah, it was a little like there were there were a lot of got into the weeds pretty quickly. Dud, a lot of duds in yeah. there, yeah. Yeah, some like stylized honey badger logos, <laughs> and eventually we just went. We just we uh, decided to go with somebody from uh, this freelancer. We got off of Odesk. What's it called now? What's Odesk called now? Upwork. Upwork. Yeah. Upwork. Uh, back then it was still Odesk. We got. I think they were from Argentina, uh, and they helped us out. Like they just they knocked out this logo. And I think we all, we all liked that one. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's our current logo. It's our current logo. It was a riff off the lightning bolt because we were just like, okay, nobody can agree on like these badger concepts. Let's just go back and make a fancier lightning bolt. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I mean, it's great because like, there's absolutely no other company, you know, that it, either then or now that has a lightning bolt <laughs> for a logo. So I know, um, I know we're it's totally, unique. it's really worked in our favor. Yeah, especially not a yellow or orange lightning bolt. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah. definitely none of our direct competitors have a logo in a very similar <laughs> shade of orange. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the the border, uh, you know, uh, where we really stand out is the border, I think, the, uh, you know, oh, around the lightning bolt, bolt because yeah, ours, is a, ours is a diamond. And, um, you know, everyone else is like a square or a, or a circle or something. Um, so. Yeah, I think we got a, a couple, maybe there's maybe a hexagon involved. Somewhere. Or a hexagon is yeah. that, yeah. yeah. Diamonds are forever. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's a um, that's one example of a sort of dispute that we had. And frankly, there was no system involved in resolving that. It was just we just all fought about it until we were just exhausted of fighting about it. And <laughs> yeah, basically. And then we basically resolved never to change the logo again. Like <laughs> that's something I'm never going to do. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't care if if it it starts to look dated in another ten years. I'm not. I'm not going to do it. Like I'm going to sell the company before I change the logo. That's like classic brand advice too, though. Like you never want to change the the logo, no matter how bad it is, because <laughs> people just know it. Like yeah. people want to know Honey Badger if they didn't have, a, you know, if they didn't see our our wonderful logo. I I was just thinking about the Slack logo. It's like I definitely don't want the internet to bring out their pitchforks when we, we change our logo. So oh yeah, never oh, yeah. they do, man. They do. Like, they do, and I guess like. If you're gonna do it, I, I, you know, there's been a few that have done it, but most of them are like slack size or or larger. It seems. Well, I guess let me let me step back. Like this, the the logo thing was an example of just a dispute about a specific thing. But we also, I think, found ourselves kind of drifting towards pulling the company in different 
directions almost, right? Because we were all kind of working on things that we personally wanted to work on. And we all had our own sort of ideas of where the company was going. And that's, you know, that's understandable. But we didn't really have much coordination like between us or making sure we're all on the same page or whatever. Eventually, that was kind of difficult because it's we're all sort of on, on different pages. And I think that's when we instituted the system of the uh, quarterly conclave. Yeah, I think our <clears throat> silos got a little too far apart there. So we decided we had to coordinate a little better. Yeah, well, and we realized like that while the silos work pretty well for like actually getting getting a lot of work done, they don't work well for coordinating, like moving in the same direction. I think we found that we needed to have somewhere where we actually like decided on larger, big picture things that we wanted to happen in the company. Otherwise it was just going to kind of keep, you know, drifting in whatever direction the three of us each like would pull it. And, uh, that's when we started the conclave and meeting up on a regular basis. Yeah. So first we just did the meetups. Um, the con- we call them conclaves as a joke because we sort of like go into seclusion for a day, have a day long meeting at an undisclosed location. Um, it's, it's varied. Um, right now um, we meet at an undisclosed location that, that is a converted bank fault. And I've posted about that on Twitter. Yeah. We have a day long meeting. And at first it was just kind of like us in a room talking in each other. And, but eventually we kind of, I think based on some books, we came up with a a system for like what we do. So you want to like, should we go through like what a typical conclave uh, involves? We first got the idea from, we all read a book called uh, Scale and I had it here. It was, um, which one was it? It was a Scale, Seven Proven Principles to Grow Your Business and Get Your Life Back uh, by Jeff Hoffman and David Finkel. And I think I may have gotten that from the Tropical MBA podcast. I believe those, I think one, at least one of those guys is, is he tropical MBA? Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't think he wrote the book, but they, they recommended a lot of books. And, okay. And it's, it's about the guy, these guys, they built a business, um, sell manufacturing, like fancy cat furniture, you know, like stuff for cats. Yeah. And so they, they like moved to Asia so they could oversee the manufacturing of it and live this like, like baller lifestyle. And then they, you know, uh, moved on and started making like portable bars for like events um, yes, yeah. whatever. And then they sold those companies. And, and anyway, lots of lots of good advice. Um, well, I remember yeah. reading, I've read a couple, I read some books by them. And uh, one of the ones we read recently was After the Exit, I think. Um, and that was that was pretty interesting. It was kind of like a devil's advocate view of like selling their business. Um, so yeah, that was that's kind of interesting for me. Um, and if you're in a like a bootstrap, if you're in like a bootstrap company, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about what happens if you did sell and are you actually happy, even if it's, you know, are you happy with just money versus having a business that you love? Yeah. Like the point of that book was like, everybody focuses on selling your business, but um, yeah, it's like a lot of times a, when you sell your business, you you wish you hadn't. Yeah. And there's like a period of grief that you have to go through uh, that a lot of founders go through. And yeah, it's, it was interesting. So anyway, what does this book scale? Um, what do we get from that? It's kind of a, I mean, it was a fairly practical book. Like they have an actual process, like, you know, planning processes and things. Um, and it basically like a system for building a company that, uh, that runs itself um, without being reliant on the founders. And I think that's what we've kind of always wanted, you know, to some extent is like, we would like to have a machine that works when we go on vacation or whatever. We don't want to be stuck doing things like we don't want the business to fall apart if, if we go away for a while or forever. Like it doesn't really matter. It's, it's kind of the point. Um, scale was a system for that. There's a, there's a lot of other books out there that kind of have similar things. Like it seems like there's a lot of people who have kind of like written this book based on their own particular experiences. Yeah. There's, there's other ones I've seen. I know there's also one called scaling up, which is pretty similar. Yeah. I just remember initially, like we didn't have any of that in mind, right? We were just building something we wanted and wanted to make some money and that was good enough. But at some point it was like, and and Josh was really, as I recall, like really pushing this, like I want a system for the business so that we're not always working in the business. Right. And uh, Mm -hmm. to make it like, extend past us. You know, I had actually forgotten um, that that book scale like had a bunch of that stuff because what we took from it was mostly the um, the quarterly planning system, but it has a bunch of other stuff too. But so what what is the quarterly planning? Like, how does that work? And how have we changed that sort of over? The, like, have we modified it at all? Ours is a, ours has become a lot looser than is in the book. 
because I've kind of I've read through a number of these types of books now, and like I said, there's a lot of them that are, that kind of like echo each other in different ways. And I think I think every business kind of needs to like figure out what you know, like what system actually works for for it specifically. And I think everyone will kind of take you know, there's you can take things from different places and kind of build your own way of doing things. But um, we're still pretty we're loosely based on on the. Um, yeah, the system in that book. And I, but I think like most of what we do is basically, it's called a quarterly action plan. And it's basically just kind of a, like a template document that we use to kind of help us go through, um, like what our goals are for, for the business at at this moment in time, and then translate that into some like actionable things that we can do throughout like a single quarter. Um, so we do this like four times a year and that's like a really good pace for, for planning like strategic goals, I think is kind of like the, you know, you've got the annual and then the quarterly planning cycle and uh, it helps keep us on track um, on in, in the bigger picture sense. The first step in our sort of modified version of it, because I mean, really like books like scale and um, I, I don't know, books about scaling up. A lot of times they're talking about much larger companies than we have. Yeah. And they're talking about setting goals for divisions and departments and things. And it's like, we don't really have those. We've got um, at the time we had three people. Now we have five people. There's really no divisions. Like we had to modify it and make it a little bit more flexible. The first step in our quarterly planning process is we decide focus areas that we're going to focus on for um, the quarter, right? Mm-hmm. How many of those would you usually do? Like three? Try to keep it to three. It's, uh, it's three focus areas and uh, each focus area has up to five individual items within it that we want to tackle. And these are so like, like, what's a, what's a focus area? What's an, a couple examples? So f- a focus area could be, um, say like acquisition, like customer acquisition. Yeah. Like customer acquisition. Um, I think like lately ours have pretty much like they've, they haven't changed very much. Um, typically like we have customer acquisition and, uh, and we have product usually cause there's a, at least lately we've been wanting to do things in those two areas. Um, a few years ago, we had problems around ops, right? Where we were feeling the pain of our, yeah. of our hosting company and we wanted to move to Amazon and that was like a, a multi-quarter project. But that was one of the things that we set as a as an action plan for a couple of conclaves, right? Here are the, mm-hmm. you know, the steps because it, it was a bit of a process. So here are the steps we want to accomplish this quarter so that we can be set up to do X, Y, and Z next quarter. Yeah. It's been really helpful to have those action plans in place for the things that take longer than a month or a week or whatever that we know it's going to take a while. Yeah, that kind of that kind of proves that it actually works too because uh, I remember back then for you know probably for even a year or more like operations was one of our focus areas that was like the top one yep. that didn't you know it didn't go away and now today like I don't remember the last meeting that we had that was operations so that was the, you know that was on the sheet so yeah that's true um yeah so let's uh, so we've defined our like focus areas they could be marketing it could be um retention it could be operations it could be yeah. i don't know um hiring there's there's lots of different things sort of these big broad categories and then we set up to I don't know, three to five items per um, section. And these are, these are not like little to-do items. These are things that it, it would take a quarter of somebody yeah. working part-time on them. What are some examples of those? So like my um, last, last quarter, one of my things was, you know, set up this podcast and get it going. And believe you me, there's a lot of work involved in setting up a podcast. So that was a pretty good um, thing to have, you know, yeah. a quarter to do. And that, and, and that was like one item. That was so one item. These, are, these are very broad things. It's not like, yeah, it's not yeah. small. It's not like a to-do list. And then most yeah. importantly, like each of those items is assigned to a person who is the person mm-hmm. responsible for it. There's, there's no confusion about who's going to do what. And I mean, we don't always get them done. We don't always finish, you know, what we started or what we set out to do because sometimes, you know, things pop up and, and prevent us from doing that. But man, I got to tell you, I love the system because before that, like, I just, I was so stressed out because I, I didn't really know what you guys expected me to be doing on, working on uh, versus like what I was just happened to be working on. I didn't really know like mm-hmm. how, what I was doing sort of mapped to the overall strategy of the company. It was just very vague and stress inducing. But now it's like, okay, I'm not sure what I should be doing. Okay, let me look at my list of three quarterly goals. Okay, I'm just going to work on one of those. One of the other things I liked uh, from the scale book um, that kind of helps us come up with those like individual, like the sub items within the action plan is the, uh, the sweet spot analysis. 
Oh, what's that? I forget all about that. We don't always do it exactly like they have in the book. They have like, they actually have like print out templates and stuff that you can use. I think this is more just like a way of thinking now that we use, you know, versus like an actual, like an actual system. But the sweet spot analysis was like, it had to do with low hanging fruit and, um, and the, uh, like basically finding finding things to do that in the business that are both low hanging so that they're you know it's not like it's not like a ton of work to accomplish them you might be able to knock them out in a quarter or less or you know even maybe a, a week or a day so the combination of that you know it's easy to get done but it also ha- will have a high impact on the business or on your whatever your immediate goal is yeah um, and so you can kind of like make a big list of these all these ideas of things you could do in a quarter um, and then basically like, like score it against, is it, is it low hanging fruit and what is the impact on the business or on, you know, what we're trying to accomplish? It gives you uh, you know, a weighted list of things to do and you kind of, kind of just start with the top. So the sweet spot analysis is a way to populate your list of uh, tasks to do yeah. per action item. So you find like, it's like you make a big list of everything you could do, then you figure out, okay, which is going to give you the most impact for the least amount of effort. And then you do those things first. Yeah, there are there are other yeah. other ways that is represented. Like some some people use a quadrant kind of chart where it's four quadrants mm-hmm. where they map effort versus impact, right? And um, basically that, yeah, like you said, star, that's that's the idea. Like what are the low effort things that get the most high impact? And you definitely don't want to spend time on the high effort things that have low impact, right? I don't know. We've done a couple of those. We have. That could be a separate show. It could be our <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> our our anti planning show. A lot of those, a lot of those were probably before we started doing this, and and are maybe are the reason we started doing this. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I think one of the other benefits of the plan that we do is you know being customer driven sometimes means we are reactionary. Like uh, mm-hmm. you know, customer comes up with something or something just happens, and we have to deal with that. And I know for me, like it's easy to get distracted with the day to day things that just need to be done. And uh, sometimes I forget, I lose sight of the larger picture, the things I'm trying to accomplish, right? And so with that, like Star was saying, looking, going back to that quarterly plan, looking, oh, what are my goals for this quarter helps get me recentered, refocused back on the things I want to be doing rather than just the things that pop up in my face. So we did this, we implemented this, um, this system based on primarily the scale book, our quarterly meetings, our quarterly conclaves, and we you know, set out these plans. And that's all great. But there, I noticed, I started to, to notice there was this one um, sort of problem in that we discussed a lot of things at these meetings that weren't necessarily part of the quarterly action plans, right? You got to make a lot of decisions in business. Um, and some of those are, you know, they involve a lot of money, they involve, you know, directions for the business to go in. And I started to notice it was very difficult for me to uh, personally tell when something was, you know, are we just brainstorming versus are we making a decision here? So like, are we just talking about potential budgets for set, you know, for hiring somebody for buying something, whatever, or are we actually making it a decision to, you know, budget certain money? And yeah, because so, Ben and I love to brainstorm. Yeah, you guys do. <laughs> you guys do. And my my general uh, mode of like working typically has been like if I if I say like I think this might be an okay course of action, like I've probably spent two weeks thinking about it and have decided like yes, this is one hundred percent the best course of action. And so yeah, so yeah. there's a little bit of uh, mismatch there and the the impedance. So I came up with this voting system. So it's it's really simple. I mean, it's just like what you would imagine, right? So essentially for um, big decisions like budgets um, yeah. and things like that, we well, have... First, first, you put on your powdered wigs. <laughs> yes, we have to put on our right. powdered wigs. Well, that's um, first things first. <laughs> well, we're not like barristers. We're not... <laughs> Do you put on a powdered wig when you go to vote for president, Josh? I hope so. <laughs> every yeah every four years yeah so yeah so like if we want to change the budget if we want to do anything sort of that's you know big um involves a lot of money involves a change in business um, involves hiring people etc we write up a proposal for it and we have a, a place in base camp where we um, have all these and you post it in base camp then there's some comments you know because usually even when everybody knows we're making a decision People remember that decision slightly differently. People sort of uh, just completely honestly emphasize different parts of it. And so a lot of times you end up thinking you're in agreement, but you actually kind of have different ideas about what that means. And so then like later on, when somebody does something different, you're like, well, well, I thought we agreed on this and we're doing something different now. 
when in fact there was never really an agreement. So yeah, so you uh, you write up a proposal and then you hash it out in the comments, make sure everybody really understands what that all means. And then there's just a you know straight vote on it, right? Either it's unanimous or it's not. So that as simple as it is, has really made my life less stressful because you know, now I know like, okay, well, if there's a big decision being made, it's going to be in the voting booth. And so I can just brainstorm with these guys or whatever. And I don't have to worry mm-hmm. about like, am I committing myself to something? The thing that I've really appreciated about that, uh, that particular system is the documentation aspect of it. And you kind of talked about that a little bit just now, but it really helps to get things documented and down on paper, because like you said, they do tend to like how we see them tends to drift over time. And if we have something that we can go back to and, and you know, refresh ourselves on it really, it's really helpful. That's true. It's very nice to be able to say, okay, what, what was our marketing budget again? And you go and you can yeah. just look it up. It's right there. I still, I still want to get you a gavel star. Oh yeah. I mean, I have a gavel emoji. Isn't that yeah. good enough? <laughs> We've well, got the emoji. I, I just want to get you, I want to get you like a physical, a physical gavel. Uh, just one of the things I think is interesting about the voting booth is that uh, it's, it doesn't, it didn't feel natural to me right? Um, Like we've always kind of run the business pretty loosely. And I guess this comes down to the difference like you're talking about and and how we think about things like Josh and I were pretty much off the cuff and like, hey, let's go do that thing. And then we go off and we do that, right? And and Star, you like to think about things more, I guess, than we do. Uh, So like the voting booth really felt to me like a whole lot of friction was added to the process. And so initially I was like, I just don't even want to deal with, I mean, come on, we can just agree. Right. And, uh, but the points that you made, I think have proven out over time. Like I've seen the value there. And so I think it's, it's okay to, uh, introduce some things into the business that you might not love. Right. If, if it really does make it better for everyone that's involved. Yeah. I'm so glad. I'm so glad it seemed it's uh, sort of proven itself to be useful to you. And I mean, we're really also like, we're talking about like four or five votes a year. Like, yeah, yeah, it's not a whole lot. Point, we haven't done one in a, in a while. Yeah. I mean, the last one we did was uh, to set a budget for hiring. And that was good because we had some, we, I, as you said, we had some uh, differences of recollection of what we agreed to do, like when we had our yeah. conclave, right? And so documenting that said, no, this, this is exactly what we mean and what we plan to do. So that was, we, we've talked for like half an hour about this. Um, did you guys want to go ahead and um, keep talking? We could maybe split it into a uh, con- to be continued second episode? Yeah, I think we could split it into a second episode because like the the documentation thing, like documenting the business, that's a pretty good segue into, you know, not just um, documenting stuff, you know, for day-to-day use, but also in light of what you might be thinking for selling your business, right? And getting Mm -hmm. plans down. And then also we could talk about documenting the, the, how you do your business every day, like the ops stuff and the customer support stuff and things like that. So yeah, totally. I mean, we could talk um, for quite a while on that stuff, I think. Are you guys down to do that for another half an hour? Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Okay, cool. Um, can I take a, a can I take a bathroom break? <laughs> yeah. <And then> we'll, <laughs> uh, no, Star, you can't you cannot. Do you want to <laughs> we, we have to keep going? <laughs> find a bottle. That's a hell of a cliffhanger. Hey everybody, this is Star, America's favorite honey badger. I can say that because um, Ben and Josh are off at RailsConf doing their conference marketing thing and I'm stuck here at Honey Badger headquarters editing this show for you guys. Stay tuned next week for part two of this episode. And in the meantime, why don't y'all just uh, head over to iTunes and give us one of those little uh, five-star reviews that everybody's been talking about. So yeah, just go over, you know, hit number five for us. And you know what? If you start a podcast, just email me and I'll do the same thing for you. So no collusion. Peace. ThunderQuest is a weekly podcast by the founders of Honey Badger. Zero instrumentation, 360-degree coverage of errors, outages, and service degradations for your web apps. If you have a web app, you need it. Available at honeybadger.io. Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word. You can access our huge back catalog or sign up for our newsletter to get exclusive VIP content. FounderQuest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week.